Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is the launch webinar for Tactical Data Engagement, a new guide from the Sunlight Foundation. My name is Alex Dodds, and I'm the Open Cities Storyteller here at Sunlight, and I want to thank you all for taking the time to join us. Uh, like I said, we're going to be talking about a new guide that you can download on our website today at sunlightfoundation.com slash TDE. This guide was created as part of our work with What Works Cities, and we're excited to welcome in particular some cities who we have not had the chance to work with before. Uh, this event is the first of the What Works Cities uh, opportunities for cities anywhere in the country, not just limited to their partner cities. So we're excited to welcome everyone to the event today. We have a really fantastic program for you today, and we welcome your comments and questions about this new guide. For those of you following along on the web, you can type your questions into the chat box on your screen. You can also tweet them to us at Sun Foundation or the hashtag tactical data. Our panelists for today are Stephen Larrick, Open Cities Director at the Sunlight Foundation, Krata Kratowitz, Kara Kratowitz, I'm sorry, Data Projects Coordinator at the City of Madison, Wisconsin, Emily Herrick, Service Designer at Reboot, and April Urban, Research Associate at Case Western Reserve University Center on Urban Poverty and Community Development. We uh, have a chance to take questions and answers from our panelists a little bit later in the program. So if you have questions for any of these folks in particular, like I said, you can chat them uh, using your chat box or uh, find us on Twitter. So to start us off, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague here, Stephen Merrick. Stephen? All right, that, I, I always enter a conversation with an eerie noise, so thanks everyone. <laughs> Um, thanks everyone for joining and thank you Alex for that introduction. I'm Stephen Larry, Sunlight's Open Cities Director. Uh, and tactical data engagement has really become the focus of my and my team's work in recent months. Um, believe it or not, it's what gets me out of bed in the morning, no irony at all there. Um, and we're really excited about, excuse me, finally sharing this new approach um, with all of you today. Uh, so next slide. Great. Um, so my job is to give you an overview to help kind of frame uh, the conversation that we're going to be having today with all our wonderful panelists. Um, so here's my overview of the overview that I'm going to provide. Uh, first, I'll be sharing a little bit of the conceptual background uh, on the question, what is tactical data engagement? Um, then I'll be getting a little bit more concrete, uh, trying to answer this question, but really, what is it that we're talking about here? Um, and hopefully that will uh, help inform um, and give a, a reference point in terms of who we're talking to on our panel today um, and why. Uh, so kind of throughout the conversation, I'll be flagging the parts of the tactical data engagement process uh, that each of our panelists will be speaking to. Uh, so let's jump in. Next slide, please. Um, so what exactly is tactical data engagement? Um, what are we talking about when we use this, this kind of... Uh, complicated phrase. Next slide, please. Um, at its most basic, what we're really talking about here is a way for city halls to get more impact out of their open data initiatives by proactively helping community members use open government data in impactful ways. Um, so it can be thought of as a way to recenter the work of open data around simple but often look overlooked questions like, what information do community members need? What people need what specific information to do what specific things? And how can we support those specific users in doing those specific things with open government data? Um, next slide. Um, so, so why does the open data field need tactical data engagement? What's the challenge that we're trying to address here? Um, Sunlight has been working at the municipal level on, on issues of open data since 2012. Um, and through conducting more, more kind of targeted research on the impact of open data um, of late, really starting in late 2015. Um, and what we've really observed is that there's often a misalignment. Um, you know, although programs have increasingly provided better and better access to data, uh, access to government information online, um, 
there's this goal that a lot of programs are committing to um, about making government more collaborative um, and kind of leveraging the power of collaborative action um, to kind of do more with less um, and to build trust. And we're seeing that a lot of programs, not for lack of trying and not for lack of having that as a desired outcome, um, are experiencing a misalignment between what their program says it wants to do and what it's actually doing. Um, so we're seeing that cities want open data used, but it often isn't utilized very much. Um, and local actors, community members, want information, they want open data that's usable uh, for their specific purposes, and it often isn't. So really what we've distilled uh, from all of our research and observations is that programs need two key things. They need more specificity. So rather than thinking about a task that we really consider impossible of making all data usable to all people, um, open data programs need to better connect to specific community actors and specific use cases. And uh, uh, the, the next uh, need that we've identified is really a need for experimentation uh, and for more incremental approach. So open data programs need to be able to make this connection to users and use cases in the short term um, under conditions of limited resources that we often see. So a bit about our inspiration. Um, in order to address these needs that, we've, that we identified, um, we thought, you know, we, we did a literature, literature review of a lot of different approaches, um, but I wanted to flag two of them as key inspiration points for us human-centered design and tactical urbanism. Um, so human-centered design, uh, as defined by IDEO, is a design and management framework that develops solutions to problems by involving the human perspective in all steps of the problem-solving process. Uh, and tactical urbanism, as defined by like Mike Leiden and Street Plans, um, is a deliberative approach to city making, sometimes sanctioned, sometimes not, that allows a host of local actors to test new concepts before making substantial political and financial commitments. And we think that together, these two approaches really um, tap into these two needs that we've identified. So specificity, both bring the perspective, uh, a perspective on how to design with the actual needs of users, uh, and by users, of course, we mean urban residents in mind. Um, and both really embrace this idea of prototyping, experimentation, and incremental uh, progress. So both stress the importance of testing ideas incrementally along with users uh, and prototyping solutions, iterating based on experiential human feedback before committing to a final product. Um, so to sum up this kind of con conceptual background here, um, tactical data engagement can be understood as human-centered design for open data. It can be understood as tactical urbanism for open data. Um, and to sum that up, it's a way of working with local actors to jointly figure out how to best get public information in the hands of those who need it and how to support them in doing impactful things with that information. Okay, enough of that mumbo jumbo. Really though, what is it? What are we talking about here? Um, first of all, what tactical data engagement is, is the result of a lot of research that Sunlight has been conducting over the past six months. Um, We've been researching projects that embody the ethos that we described uh, in this kind of conceptual background. We've been piloting this work in, in select what work cities, um, such as Glendale, Arizona, and now Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and as some of you may recall, we synthesized a lot of our initial thinking um, into a beta version of our, of our tactical data engagement guide that sparked lots of great feedback from both cities and from subject matter experts. Um, so if anyone on the, on the call contributed or had conversations with us about our beta work, um, thank you. Uh, very much in the spirit of tactical data engagement, you helped us to iteratively improve um, our resource based on your feedback. And the, the result of that process has been the new guide that we're so excited to share with you today. We're no longer in beta. Our version one of the guide is up on our website now, as Alex mentioned at the, at the, office, at the start of this presentation. It's at sunlightfoundation.com slash TDE. Um, and so another answer to what is tactical data engagement practically is it's a guide that you can access, download, comment on, and implement to help your city connect its open data program to resident needs and impact. Um, but of course, that's a little bit of a comp out. What is it a guide about? Uh, so, so finally, we arrive at a real answer here. Um, tactical data engagement is a four-step process um, that you can see here in this diagram. Um, 
So there were lots of changes from, from the beta version of our guide, if you're familiar with that. The biggest is that we've, put, we've really distilled all these ideas that we were thinking about, all our inspirations, and all the projects that we learned from into a process that we think any city hall can follow and replicate um, to better connect the open data program um, to the people and who need to use data and to the impactful uh, results that, that come from community actors using open data. Um, so that process, as you can see, is to start first by finding a focus area by observing the community. Um, and really what we mean by that is essentially just in order for data to have relevance and to be applicable to specific people, it, it can't be, you need to, it becomes more applicable as soon as you've kind of started to focus in on a, on a specific application, on a specific area. This could be something simple, like simply as simple as public safety, um, parks and recreation, economic development, planning, uh, et cetera. The next step is to refine that, that focus area into use cases by interviewing stakeholders. Um, so after you've identified a focus area, really do some stakeholder mapping, think about who are the relevant actors of that focus area and talk to them, have a conversation with them to really understand what their information needs are and why they might need information. The third step is to design a plan um, to support some of those use cases identified in the refined stage um, by coordinating with target users of open data. And then finally, the fourth step is to implement an intervention uh, from that plan by collaborating with the actual users of the open data. So um, I think that that gives you an overview. I wanna give a few notes about this four step process before we jump and dive into each of the four steps. Um, first of all, specificity. You'll note that we've started from a broad place of just simply saying, what is a broad area? We're not sure necessarily how data is going to be used or what impact it's going to have. Um, but what's an area where the community is interested um, and where there seems to be the good, a good opportunity for community actors to use open data? Um, each step then focuses in from a broad community of collaborators um, towards specific stakeholders, again, more specific target users, and then even more specific actual users of open data, um, hones in on more specific use cases, uh, and hones in on an, eventually an actual tangible inter intervention um, that is within the capacity of the city to actually implement. So I think it's important to understand what the goal is here. It's to implement something tangible that can make progress towards larger goals. It's not to solve all the problems of an open data program in one fell swoop. Um, the next thing I want to note is that each of the step contains ingredients. They're, they're these kind of color-coded ingredients that you saw on the previous slide. Um, it includes an action, a mode of engagement, collaborators, and a result. Um, the result of the previous step feeds into the action of the next step, and the engagement and collaborators ensure that the eventual intervention being planned has been catered to what is needed to support users and impact. It's not, it's not removed from the actual application of the data, it's something that we are ground truthing throughout the process. Finally, a note on tactics. Um, we think that there are many approaches that may be appropriate for accomplishing each of the steps of the TDE process. We call these different approaches tactics. Um, tactics are lightweight, low cost, and modular. Um, and we, we've really thought about, about it this way, that there are tactics that can be catered for any city's capacity or budget. Um, so for each step of the TDE process, we really encourage cities to think about what, how they can best accomplish that step and, and to utilize realistic tactics that fit their needs, their budget, their staffing, et cetera. So I'm, I'm proud of this slide. We've got an animated GIF here, um, but we're gonna just dive briefly into this four step process. So first of all, find a focus area by observing the community. Um, as I mentioned before, this is about focusing in on a particular issue, um, something that's relevant to your community, something that seems to have a pr the promise that there might be actors in the community who need to use information uh, in this particular area. And there are many ways to do that in infinite focus areas that might work for your city's TDE projects. So 
the idea is not to find the perfect answer, but really to find a promising question to explore. Um, so nearly any focus area will have information associated with it and community actors who need information to do important things. So really don't get too hung up if you don't exactly know who those people are who are gonna do important things with data and what data they might need. Um, as they say in human-centered design, really this is a step about embracing ambiguity. Um, that said, we do think there are some, some tactics that can be helpful for um, ensuring that there's, there are opportunities and there are actual actors from your community who are interested in using data during the find step. Um, so for example, in Exampleville, USA, we might work with the city to analyze public records requests, data set requests, informal requests for information, or even 311 requests or complaints to observe what kind of information the community is demanding most. Um, you might notice, uh, if you're familiar with our work, that Exampleville sounds a little bit like Glendale, Arizona, where we did just that, analyzing public records requests um, to find that there was roughly 40% of, of requests for information were being routed to a, a, a department called Development Services. Um, so a lot of folks were interested in planning, zoning, uh, building code information, um, which gave us a pretty good idea that there were opportunities for open data use within that focus area. We're currently working with Madison, Wisconsin on a different approach to the find step. Um, and Kara Kratowitz from Madison will be talking a bit about that. So do um, look for that in Kara's presentation. Next, we have the refine step. Um, so the result from, from the first step will yield a focus area. And in the refine step, the goal is to better understand and segment out the different uses of information relevant to that focus area by having conversations with stakeholders. Um, so in our, in our Exampleville uh, example, after analyzing those information demand channels like public records, maybe as with Glendale, we've found that planning and development information is, is something that community members are requesting. We might then interview stakeholders that are, that are um, relevant to the planning and development focus area in example bill. So folks like developers, nonprofit and for-profit developers, tenant associations, other nonprofits and neighborhood associations, financial institutions, land use attorneys, etc. cetera. Um, and especially including anyone who might have requested that information. We have a good hunch if they're, they're requesting information, they're using information. Um, so the goal of these, these interviews and these conversations might be to find out who needs what information for what purposes? And are there any barriers to that use case? Um, so the output from the refined stage is really a set of user personas, the who, who's using information, as well as the user journeys that explain how that information is used within the planning and development focus area in example bill. Uh, this step and, and kind of the example tactic that I described of, of design interviews, ethnographic interviews, is classic human-centered design. And we're lucky to have an expert in that field, Emily Herrick, to talk with us a little bit about her work with Reboot, creating user personas and conducting this type of research in order to delineate open data use cases in New York City. Um, and if we're lucky, maybe she'll even touch a little bit on how she's going to be supporting um, Sunlight and the City of Madison on the refined step um, in some of our pilot work there. Next, we have the design phase. So during the refine phase, we'll have uncovered various user personas and use cases within the focus area. Some of them will be more promising than others in terms of alignment with the city's goals, uh, alignment with the capacity of the city to support that use case, and with the potential for positive impact. Um, so during the design phase, the goal is to pick one of these use cases. Um, one set of a who, a what information, and a why, and to come up with a plan for how to support that use case in coordination with those target users of open data. Um, so to give an example to make this a little bit more tangible, in Exampleville, if we've uncovered a number of use cases during our interviews with the real estate community, um, the planning and development world, we might have uncovered a few different ways in which folks are using information. Um, and again, an example bill is a lot like Glendale. One of those uh, use cases might be that appraisers need information about building permits to verify new construction 
and to include built improvements in appraisals, uh, appraisals that are necessary for real estate transactions, um, or to re reevaluate uh, uh, improvements on a property for the purpose of, of accurately uh, assessing property so the city can collect tax revenue on all built improvements. So these are important things tied to the city's revenue uh, and tied to economic development in the city. Um, and it might be that these things are aligned with the city's strategic goals. So if that's the case, during the design uh, phase, Exampleville might work with appraisers and um, learn from them that actually when they try to access the permit information, um, they, have to, they currently have to scroll through PDFs uh, that are put out monthly with reports uh, that are not organized by address um, that have the permit information. Um, and it might be that kind of understanding this pain point, this barrier to accessing the relevant information, um, the city can work with those appraisers to design a plan, for instance, of putting out guidance on how to better find uh, permit data by address, um, or putting out structured permit data as a, as a CSV alongside those monthly reports, or even building a search by address tool that can help appraisers connect with those uh, that needed permit information by address, which is really how they need it. So step four is pretty straightforward. It's implement, um, do the thing that you planned. So um, your plan may have included a number of ideas of things that can be done to support the specific use case that's been identified within the specific focus area. Um, and the idea in the implement phase is to identify um, a tangible intervention that's within the city's capacity to implement um, that can actually help support that use case. So an example though, it may not be that the city has immediate capacity to build a search by address tool, but they can start sharing CSVs about permit data alongside those monthly PDF reports and provide instructions on how to sort that CSV by address so that the appraisers can more easily find what they're looking for. Um, and what's important about this step is that when you have a prototype, when you've actually put an intervention out there, you can start talking to those actual users, those appraisers, about whether it's working or not. Um, and iterate upon whatever the intervention is to make sure that it does work to address needs. Um, we're lucky to have April Urban from the Poverty Center in Cleveland, um, who has experience both kind of designing and implementing a solution to better connect community groups to needed data. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing about uh, that work in Cleveland. So that kind of concludes the overview here of, the, of both the conceptual framework of tactical data engagement, um, a little bit of the history of our work developing this guide, as well as the four steps that really make up the, the crux of the process. Um, and we're, we're really glad to kind of have these steps illustrated even further by the real experience and perspe perspective of our panelists. So back to you, Alex. Sure, and uh, now we'll turn it over to Kara Kratowitz, the Data Projects Coordinator at the City of Madison. And before I, you get started, Kara, I'll just add in that for those of you who have been furiously taking notes while Stephen has been talking, uh, a recording of this webinar will be available uh, a little bit later this week on our website, so you'll be able to go back and see all of the information that he's been talking about. So with that, Kara, Thank you, Alex. Hello, everyone. My name is Kara Kratowitz, and I'm the Data Projects Coordinator in the Finance Department. Be right. uh, sure to unmute yourself if you are muted. I am not muted. Can you hear me? I can't quite hear you if you are talking. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Excellent. Hello, everyone. My name is Kara Kratowitz, and I'm the Data Projects Coordinator in the Finance Department at the City of Madison. We're very excited to be working on tactical data engagement, and I'm here to talk to you about how we went about finding a focus area. I lead the coordination of the city's work around the relaunch of our open data program, and I say relaunch because of the history of our open data program, which I think is important to understand where we are today. Next slide, please. A little bit of history about our open data program. In 2012, the city of Madison became the first city in the state of Wisconsin and the second in the nation to adopt an open data ordinance. This effort was led by an alder and is largely based on New York City's ordinance. 
Our ordinance was envisioned to enhance Madison's commitment to a transparent government, harness the talents of civically minded individuals and improve government efficiency. Some of the key components of the original ordinance include language regarding the publication of final versions of statistical or factual information and the filing of an annual report to council if the agency is not publishing to the portal. By the time the original ordinance passed, the city had only six weeks to stand up a portal and begin publishing data. In 2013, we began community outreach regarding open data through hackathons. However, the approach taken was much more prescriptive than open-ended. During the hackathons, the city came to the community with ideas for applications that could be developed instead of approaching the community with the data we had, allowing creative freedom to shape the development process. This approach actually somewhat fractured some of the relationships between the development community and the city that we are working to rebuild through tactical data engagement. Over the course of subsequent years, the city saw little progress on the adoption of the open data program internal to the city. Many agencies hid behind that clause in the original ordinance regarding the final versions of statistical or factual information, causing the efforts to release data to largely stagnate. Additionally, no one was reporting to council on this matter. So when I was hired in 2015, part of my job duties were to help the city refocus our efforts around open data to build better engagement of city agencies and with the public. Next slide, please. So how did we begin this work? Um, I began my work to relaunch open data by informationally interviewing other cities with open data policies, which I found on the Sunlight Foundation's website and applying to the What Works Cities program. For those of you not familiar with What Works Cities, it is an initiative of Bloomberg Philanthropies to help 100 mid-sized cities better use data and evidence in the decision-making process by providing cities with technical assistance through their partnering organizations, which includes the Sunlight Foundation. So October of last year, Madison was selected to participate in What Works Cities with open data as one of our key focus areas. So we began our engagement in January of this year, and that work is led internally by a cross-functional group of staff, which we call our data management work group. And this work group met on a weekly basis to develop a data governance policy and organizational structure to support the ordinance. We worked with each agency to complete a comprehensive data set inventory of all of the data we are using to manage our city agencies and identified potential areas for ordinance revision. In the middle of our engagement, Sunlight released the beta version of their tactical data engagement guide, which our work group found highly applicable to launching our work publicly, since most of the work was being done to organize ourselves internally. When we began planning internally for the application of the guide to our work this last spring, Sunlight approached us up about becoming a potential pilot for tactical data engagement. Next slide, please. Um, as we solidified our commitment to work with tactical data engagement, we simultaneously engaged with each of our departments to create publishing plans that were uh, identifying which data sets within their inventory were ready to be published so we could share that publicly. Um, after reviewing this new TDE guide, we identified the need to begin selecting a focus area as step one in the process. Now, as Stephen mentioned, there are a number of tactics that could be used to select a focus area, but we began the finding phase by um, observing popular meetings and existing public channels to find our focus area. It presented an opportunity to align with existing public engagement strategies here in Madison. The result of selecting this tactic was to align tactical data engagement with the city's rewrite of the comprehensive plan, which we call Imagine Madison. Next slide, please. So Imagine Madison completed their phase two community feedback in this past summer, and they published their feedback on the Imagine Madison website. The phase two engagement specifically consisted of three components. One was community meetings, where a list of draft strategies were published and voted on. The Imagine Madison website was also used, which had a module where users could vote on the issues that were most relevant to them and like them. And then our third was we had a, a number of resident panels that were informing the Imagine Madison process, which represented a 
traditionally underserved groups of people across the community that were coordinated by various community groups. So these three components informed what we reviewed for our find phase. Next slide, please. So the data management work group is really the who of this effort, and we reviewed the phase two feedback from the Imagine Madison process to identify the strategies of greatest interest to the public and reviewed the agency publishing plans for applicable data sets that we could potentially release. Out of this process, the four preliminary focus areas we've identified include, one is the creation of complete neighborhoods where residents have access to transit, parks, libraries, neighborhood centers, and others ameni other amenities. Um, two is the provision of economic support, such as transportation, section eight, and child care assistance. The third is green infrastructure, including rain gardens and greenways, and the fourth being public safety to promote violence prevention. So now that we've narrowed down our list, um, next slide please, we are going to be um, looking into an online polling mechanism. Um, as we move towards next steps to complete the find phase, we will launch a public poll on the four potential focus areas that I just mentioned, complete neighborhoods, economic supports, green infrastructure, and public safety. We want the community to decide what information will be most value added to release, while understanding that this process is intended to be iterative and those other topics may be covered in the future. We plan to promote the poll through social media, the upcoming mayor's roundtable, um, and targeted stakeholder engagement to spiderweb the voting mechanism to finalize that finding of our focus area. As part of this phase, we also began stakeholder mapping and outreach to help promote the polling efforts moving into the refine phase. So we are still in the middle of our find phase and doing a lot of work to get this off the ground. And I'm happy to answer any questions after the other presenters have had a chance to go through the other steps of the process. Great, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Karen. Now we'll turn it over to you, Emily Herrick, service designer at Reboot. Thanks, can you guys hear me? Yep, you sound good. Okay, cool. Um, hi everyone, so my name is Emily Herrick. Uh, you can go to the next slide, I guess. Um, I work for an organization called Reboot. We're a social enterprise focused on accountable governance. And I'm, I'm going to give you a bit, a little bit of background about who we are and kind of why we are important to this process. Um, we advance public sector innovation using design as a strategic tool to change the way governments work. Um, we're based in NYC. We have an office in Nigeria as well. And um, I think we're fortunate because we work with a, a wonderful group of partners, both domestically and internationally. Um, our work on open data has grown out of our interest in making governments more accountable and participatory. I think um, using these terms like open government and open data only matter if they have an impact on people's lives. And this impact really comes from a genuine understanding of what people actually need. And that's kind of where our um, focus on user research comes in. So I'm going to be talking about a recent collaboration that we did with the New York City Open Data team, where we really set them up for phase three of the tactical uh, data engagement by helping them kind of understand focus areas and conduct user research. Um, uh, you can go to the next slide, I think. Um, our goal with the um, NYC Open Data team was better to help them better meet the needs of both existing users and well as, as well as those um, positioned to create impact in their communities who may not be uh, currently using open data. So we called these users um, potential users. Uh, on the screen are the findings from our research. We kind of identified six different types of users and potential users. Um, and we really wanted to help the open data team reach people outside of the civic tech community, um, helping them create improvements for their open data initiative that maximize community impact, rather than just responding to those who may have the loudest voices. 
Um, and so for the user research, we encompassed many elements of the tactical data engagement. Um, we started our engagement by listening to and, and uh, analyzing voices of the different types of residents. Um, we mostly focused on what information people used and needed to make decisions and solve problems in their community. And then we uncovered and refined opportunities for the open data team to better understand these users and meet their needs and worked with internal stakeholders um, in NYC OpenGov to ref uh, refine these opportunities um, together. And then uh, we started also uh, helping them work through step three um, and developed user personas and use cases to help make the research accessible and give them kind of frameworks to use to collaboratively design and plan together. I think we played a pretty unique role as an outside partner um, because we were the ones sitting through interviews and we were the ones that were learning all of these needs for users and potential users. We really had to make sure that the learning was making its, back way, um, its way back into the government and back into these agencies. Um, and so it really, we really tried to um, work to help set them up in step two. Um, this is something that we do often as um, an outside consulting firm, firm conducting this research. Uh, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the, the learnings we've had from trying to integrate research back into program design. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so we have worked here in New York City and as well with other governments internationally and at, both at the national, the city, the local level and have really um, learned a few things about helping uh, data driven approaches actually make their way um, back into designing of program improvements. One of the first things that I learned kind of conducting this research or conducting research generally is that um, trust leads to political buy-in um, and government is made up of people and we need to make sure that people trust our approach. And so this happens when you're doing the planning of the research um, and for our engagement with New York City, it was really great because we had a partner within the um, open data team who was committed to this uh, human centered approach. And she was an internal champion that really helped our team navigate roadblocks and build trust and political buy in with a wide range of stakeholders. Um, so it's not just about the, the people that are on the open data team, but about different agencies really helping um, people understand this type of uh, approach and why it might be beneficial kind of down the road. Um, with our entry point of having this one internal champion, we were able to create momentum and influence people kind of on all different levels who may, may have not been initially enthusiastic. Um, with our open data research, we were actually working with three different agencies who make up the NYC open data team. Um, each of them play a pretty different role in the open data initiative, and they have very different perspectives and viewpoints of the process. Some are kind of uploading the data, others are working on communication to residents. And so this led to different priorities around open data improve, um, improvement. And so that comes to kind of point number two, that uh, first you need to understand and then al align institutional priorities. Um, our research wasn't just to meant to help the open data team understand potential users, um, by creating these user personas, but it was also um, meant to help them align on the use cases and on these priorities. This is very much um, encompassing of step two of the tactical data engagement. It's not just about um, kind of giving different options, but making sure internal stakeholders are bought into the process, which is where our third learning comes in. Uh, a key way for aligning on priorities is making the research accessible. So um, instead of burying findings um, from our research into a dense report, we created accessible visual assets. You saw a few um, at the beginning of this presentation, but we also um, presented those into a workshop in a workshop format. So we um, presented our user personas and our use cases in, in a workshop with all different stakeholders. This allowed people to absorb our work discuss what we learned and push back and ask questions around different focus areas and different use cases. Um, we also created assets for the open data team to take um, in, and use with different agencies. So we created a presentation um, that explained our research, a, a script to go along with it. 
to effectively you know, drum a buy-in from different agencies that would be supporting data to the portal. Um, it, and so through all of this, I wanted to take kind of uh, the last couple of minutes to kind of maybe share a little bit more about what we learned from the research. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Oh no, okay, um, sorry, this is not a full diagram. Uh, I think my slides might have gotten cut off a little bit. There's more of this, but uh, this is a framework that we produced with the um, NYC Open Data team. Oh, there it is, thank you. <laughs> um, and this was something that we um, produced after con conducting the research. Um, we talked to about 20 different residents, which was a pretty small sample size, but we talked to people with a wide range of experiences using open data. As I mentioned before, some were big, heavy data users, others had never even heard of the term open data. Um, through the discussions with these different types of residents, we understood um, their role in the open data impact cycle, and that people were not, um, not everyone wanted to be a data downloader or um, work you know, in every step of this process, but each had very different skills that they could use that contributed to this impact cycle of taking open data and actually making it useful for communities. So we developed this framework for the uh, open data team just to, as a reminder when they're doing improvements to keep these different use cases and users in mind. So for example, we spoke to a woman who runs an affordability um, affordable housing advocacy organization and she uses a lot of quantitative data to advocate for her causes in, uh, in Albany. Uh, she's got some killer instincts on understanding what um, data she needs and what evidence she wants to use to back up some of her advocacy efforts but she's never really used the open data portal but she has a great relationship with a bunch of data analysts and she communicates her needs to them and then they go to the data portal download the data sets and analyze that data. So through this collaborative, uh, this collaborative use case scenario, you can help um, continue to remind people that uh, people have different um, desires and needs from open data. So this is a framework we continue to use with, uh, um, with New York City when designing service improvements. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Emily. Uh, and now to talk a little bit more about the ideas that we discussed in step four, I'm going to turn it over to April Urban, Research Associate at Case Western Reserve University Center on Urban Poverty and Community Development. April? Thanks. I'm super excited to talk to you all today. You can hear me, right? Um, next slide. So the Poverty Center is a little bit different from some of the organizations um, talking here today. We're a research center that's a part of a social work school at Case Western Reserve University, and we're here in Cleveland, Ohio. And our mission is research and data innovations to strengthen communities and families. So we undertake work that often comes in the form of research, sometimes you know academic research, sometimes policy-focused research, uh, evaluation. So we're an evaluation partner with a lot of the local government entities, especially those around children and families. And sometimes our work takes us in into kind of building technology and in building data portals that bring data back out to the public. Uh, we are a part of the National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership, NNIP. Um, so there, it's a network of organizations that do work like ours, research, data work um, and communicating that data back out to the public in cities across the US. So I know Milwaukee um, just joined the NNIP network. Um, I saw SEMA on the attendee list earlier from the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance. So, you know, check out cities in the network. Um, there might be one near you. Next slide. So really at the heart of the work that we do at the Poverty Center is integrating data. Um, so we're an intermediary. We, we call ourselves a local data intermediary. Um, different government entities share data with us and we link those records at different levels, sometimes at the individual level, um, sometimes our research questions take us to neighborhoods. Um, so really at the heart of what we do is accessing, acquiring, and, and linking data. Um, so I'm going to talk for a minute about um, what it's, why, why governments um, 
in our area use us as a data intermediary. And of course, you know, I can only speak to my experiences in, in different projects, um, you know, bring different pluses and minuses to using us as a data intermediary. Um, but I'll say um, that we've, we've seen that sharing data across administrative entities, you know, between different government departments and sometimes um, across different jurisdictions. Uh, I think we are helpful in facilitating that kind of sharing, whereas sometimes there's, there's maybe politics involved uh, between a city and a county, for example. So we think sometimes having an intermediary helps facilitate that type of sharing um, politically. Um, from our experience, I could also say that you know, we've, we've been around for 30 years in the community, so um, we are able to take a, a longer term view to some problems than um, sometimes different political administrations are able to, you know, just because of election cycles. Um, and I think that our independence from governments has helped encourage confidence and build, help to build trust in users and in um, the community in general. So I think, you know, when a government uh, works with us, we kind of lend some credibility uh, to that project. Next slide. So I'm going to talk specifically, uh, you know, there are a lot of projects that happen at the Poverty Center that really align very well with the tactical data engagement sort of philosophy of, of thinking about how you use data. Um, but I'm going to talk specifically about our work with property data. Um, we're pretty well known for, for this, uh, for our work in this world. So as you probably are aware already, um, Cleveland was hit pretty hard by the foreclosure crisis. So this really created an environment of um, people in Cleveland and Cuyahoga County um, and throughout the county across, uh, I believe there are 58 municipalities who were interested in understanding data about properties and who saw a strong need <laughs> to use data about properties in their work um, trying to kind of stem this crisis. So facilitated by a group called VAPAC, the Vacant and Abandoned Properties Action Coalition. Uh, this coalition is made up of uh, different governmental partners and different nonprofit partners all coming together, focusing on issues of abandoned property. Uh, we're able to gain access to a wealth of property level data and this group thought, hey, you know, we need access to this data. We need to see it regularly. We need people to be able to dive in and use it in their everyday activities. Um, so we were sparked to create a portal to be able to do that. Um, the governance structure here, so we have that sort of facilitating body that's helping to understand the, the um, uh, helping a little bit to understand the end user, helping a little bit to, um, you know, translate some of the legal, some of the data nuance. Um, property, the property data world's really steeped in um, uh, the legal process. Um, so we have that also facilitating information sharing. Um, and then in terms of governance, you know, we have a few different committees that will be a part of that help um, really kind of structure and build the system. Next slide. So we've built a data system that we update weekly. Um, we aggregate and link the data. We, in this case, we actually built the technology and we host and we update it on a, on a regular basis. And we're also um, the sort of community engagement, one of the community engagement components. So we host a lot of trainings uh, to help people understand how to use the tool and then to hear back from them um, in terms of, 
you know, what they find useful, what use cases um, are they needing now as the problem shifts away from, from um, dealing with vacant and abandoned properties to dealing with other issues. Home health is really on the horizon for us right now. Um, I would say we've really built this plane while flying it. Um, <laughs> and we're, you know, kind of approaching our third version of the actual technology. Um, so we built something very quickly, got it out to users, um, really embedded ourselves in the community to understand what works, what doesn't, and went quickly to a, to a version two that was more of an extensive redo. Um, and we've been on version two for a while with just some minor changes um, and are really starting to see the potential for version three as we get more and more embedded into um, home health issues and other sort of new community problems that folks are interested in using data. So next slide, to sum it up, um, we have you know, our data library, right? And we've got all this data <laughs> and it's most useful when you can pick out that use and then get into touch with community partners to figure out what pieces and parts do you most need access to? What pieces and parts are going to help you most in your day-to-day -day life? Um, and that's it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Urban and uh, April. And I assume that the young lady who made an appearance in that last slide is someone you know. <laughs> yeah, so uh, learning point number two uh, a new mom can figure out a lot of different ways to integrate cute pictures of babies. <laughs> I like it. Uh, that'll be a, a different webinar coming later this month from some <laughs> cities, integrating cute pictures into your PowerPoint presentations. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kara and April and Emily. Um, uh, I'm going to give it to, back to Stephen quickly to tell us a little bit about how we're going to take this work forward from here. Thanks, Alex. Um, so I think very much in line with the kind of ethos that we've described today, um, we are still iterating upon our approach here. We're still iterating and building um, kind of a body of work, a body of examples that can help cities um, better connect their open data programs to real users and use cases and real impact uh, in their communities. So we want to hear how you're using your guide uh, on, on your projects in your city. We want to hear about projects um, that might have come to mind while you're listening about this approach as, as kind of fitting this model. Um, and we also want to hear from you if you're interested in doing a project um, but don't necessarily know how to get started. Um, so please check out uh, our landing page for, for tactical data engagement, sunlightfoundation.com slash TDE, um, and get in touch with us. Tell us about the work that you're working on, tell us about the work that you have heard about, uh, and let us know if you want to work with us. Great. And with that, we're going to turn it over to questions and answers. We have just a few minutes left in the hour. Um, again, if you're following along on your webinar screen, you can uh, chat your questions to us in the chat box. If you would prefer to uh, tweet them at us on Twitter, the hashtag is tactical data. So Stephen, I'm going to start with a question for you. You uh, started off this conversation by saying that tactical urbanism was one of your inspirations. and uh, there's a little bit of a spectrum in tactical urbanism from projects that are very official and done by a city versus all the way down to uh, projects that are very guerrilla and sort of DIY without permission. Is there a space in tactical data engagement for projects without permission from a city? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, one thing I'll point out before I get into my answer here is that, uh, you know, I think there's, there's actually a shared history both in kind of the IRL city of, of kind of guerrilla uh, unsanctioned improvements, whether it's planting a community garden on a vacant lot um, or, or kind of painting a crosswalk where there needs to be one. Um, and actually in the open government world, a lot of Sunlight's early work was scraping information from Congress's website uh, and putting it out there in a structured format that people could actually use. And that was unsanctioned. Um, and I think that there's certainly an opportunity. I think the more that uh, community groups can see a need um, for, for better access to information and use of information and act upon it, um, 
I think the kind of the better able uh, city halls might be to ingest it. So I think, you know, it was just parking day last Friday. And um, for those that aren't aware, parking day, it, it comes from this, this kind of field of tactical urbanism. It was started in San Francisco. Um, and the idea was to reclaim some of the parking spaces in the street um, for public space, for park space with seating and benches and green space. Um, and it started with folks just literally feeding the meter all day long, and putting benches and seats uh, in, in, the, in the meter to, to reserve that space for the public. Um, but eventually San Francisco put out a guide um, that a lot of the intended users of this guide are folks like restaurants that want extra seating on the, on the sidewalk for cafe seating. Um, and you can now apply if you want a parking spot outside your business to be a parklet, you can apply and make that so officially. Um, and so we think that there's a real opportunity here for unsanctioned um, kind of data activism to be ingested by city halls. And that we think kind of fostering this kind of communication and, and dialectic between uh, community organizations that need to use data and understanding of those use cases and what they need to support those use cases um, can actually help prepare cities to ingest that kind of unsanctioned work. Um, so whether it is uh, folks that have shared information with each other, you know, perhaps um, within a civic tech world, like, like a, I know Nick, you asked this question, if, if folks at Code for Maine have shared uh, guides with each other on how to access information in Maine uh, or how to do certain things with information in Maine, if the city could then, re or, or the state could then re-ingest those guides and say, hey, this is, we hear you're using our property data to identify out-of-state landlords, um, here's a guide on how to do that that was written by Code for Maine, and, and you know, we're going to put that on our website where we're actually sharing the data itself. We think there can be a really nice back and forth between sanctioned and unsanctioned, and we're excited to explore that further. Great. Well, on the subject of sanctioned city processes, uh, Kara, I've got a question for you. Um, it sounded like you used the Imagine Madison process as a really great entree into your tactical data engagement work. Can you talk a little bit about why you saw an opportunity to do tactical data engagement there and how other cities can, can recognize the opportunities that might not be obvious to them right now? Absolutely. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, so we chose to look at Imagine Madison because they had over 9,000 touch points with the community already that they were soliciting feedback on issues that were most important to them. And this process had already been ongoing for months and we saw a lot of potential for alignment in continuing the work of this project into their phase three, um, which will be happening later this fall. So we thought that by aligning with Imagine Madison, we could potentially help improve that process at the same time. So if I gave any advice, I think look at what's going on in your city and um, observe current and relevant processes that present a breadth of inroads to the community so that you can capture the most feedback from those um, users who are or people who are potential users of open data. That is the, the perfect segue to a question I want to ask Emily because uh, Kara it sounds like a lot of those people who you're referencing might be very tech savvy, data engaged folks, but a lot of them might just be older members of the community, people who don't have regular internet access. And my, my question for Emily is, can you do user personas for non-users or people who are not online regularly or in a way that are gonna be able to engage? How do those types of users fit into your user persona work? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And um, it's definitely something that we did with uh, New York City Open Data. We were focused on potential users. So it's interesting to think about what you would do with those that maybe have no intention or no potential to be online. But a lot of times those are the most connected to the community. We found um, our one of the our our furthest away from being an open data user persona that we created was the community champion. And this is someone that we talked to that embodied um, different people around uh, the community organizer persona. These people are highly connected to the community, have, are doing crazy awesome things, but are very skeptical of open data because of their, um, their connection with the community and that data is perceived as um, kind of, uh, it could be, 
we were talking to kind of immigrant right organi organizers and data can be kind of telling and, and um, in invasive or they just have this, this fear of data and openness um, around things like that. And, and we found making user personas for these non-users essential because you can talk about their barriers, both emotional and external. You could talk about their needs and then you could talk about what potential partnerships might look like with people who maybe are users of open data. And so I think there is a need for um, creating personas for non-users because you can include them into the ecosystem through different tactics and different um, partnerships. Yeah, that makes total sense, and especially since it sounds like those folks are going to be some of your biggest and strongest um, allies in community outreach. That sounds, seems like a fantastic um, approach to take. And it ties in uh, very neatly to a question I have for April, which is that it sounded like you had, you took a very tactical approach in the sense that you stayed flexible and uh, tried things iteratively. Can you talk a little bit about how those you know, how the community, like we just talked about, and um, all members of the community responded to that. Were they skeptical? Were they sort of unclear of what this weird institutional approach was? You know, how did they react to the, that time? Yeah. yeah, so we're very fortunate to be very embedded in the community from the start. Um, so that really helps us understand the need pretty solidly. Um, and more of the learning point was on how do you build technology to meet this need and how do you build the data to meet this need? So we, uh, our first, our biggest learning point was actually that the problem changes and we get access to new data quickly um, to help deal with the new problem so that we need technology that can keep up with um, accessing new data and can flexibly integrate new data and can flexibly be used to solve different problems. So um, it, it's kind of tough without delving into some of the specifics, but we, we talked about the, the finding bad landlords um, question, you know, so we've been able to get great data on tax delinquency for some time but we're slowly getting better data on landlords across time coming from different public housing departments and coming from sort of CDCs themselves as they contact folks. Um, so we're able to integrate new data as it comes in, as we hear from our users about new problems and new questions they wanna ask of the data. And um, they understand that, so they're, they're um, very pleased with flexibility. That's not, it doesn't sort of create a, the changes in the technology don't create much of a issue, but we're talking about a system that um, our user base is like small, but very intense, where, where folks kind of use it on a, on a daily basis um, for their work. April, so in my experience, um, Community Development Corporation, CDCs, aren't always the most um, data savvy. Could yeah. you talk a little bit about any of the pain points that they've experienced in kind of accessing the information they need and, and maybe how um, your iterative process of developing technology helped them with that? Definitely. So I think it was really helpful, again, to be super embedded in the community to understand what folks are capable of, what folks are comfortable with. Um, but mostly I'd say we launched this tool in 2010, so it was seven years ago, and we started doing monthly trainings, and I did monthly trainings for a really long time. We just shifted to quarterly trainings a couple years ago. So we, um, you know, we just really met people where they're at. I think that's part of kind of being a part of the social work school, uh, that we have that as our, as our value system. Um, but on, on, the, on the other side, you know, there's probably um, better technology out there. You know, there, there's probably some better technology solutions that can also help make things easier to use. But we took, we took a bit more of a people approach. Well, the people approach is certainly one of the central ideas that we're trying to get across here. Uh, we're just over the top of the hour and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So we'll, we'll end it here. I wanna thank all of our panelists for joining us today. 
uh, as well as everyone who's listening in. Again, you'll be able to find the guide at sunlightfoundation.com slash TDE. And a recording of this webinar will be posted on our website a little bit later this week. So if you missed anything, you can go back and see it all there. Uh, with that, we'll conclude. Thank you so much for everyone, uh, to everyone for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thanks.